uns in den Nachmittag schon kennengelernt und Ella würde sich sehr viel wohler im Englischen fühlen und auch Ellen hat gesagt, lass mich bitte auch mal auf Englisch sprechen. Wenn es jetzt keine prinzipiellen Einwände von euch und Ihnen gibt, dass es vor allem auf Englisch ist, würden wir es vor allem auch auf Englisch machen. Wenn es allerdings jetzt bei dem im Verlauf des Abends zu einem Problem wird, signalisieren Sie das gerne und dann versuchen wir darauf Rücksicht zu nehmen. Ich hoffe, das ist okay. Die Intros habe ich aber auf Deutsch vorbereitet, die ich immer vorbereite, deswegen sind die erstmal auf Deutsch und dann gucken wir in einem Mischmasch von verschiedenen Sprachen, aber wahrscheinlich vor allem Englisch, wo wir rauskommen. Okay, also zu meiner Rechten sitzt Anne Cotton, sie wurde in der amerikanischen Kleinstadt Ames, Iowa im Jahr 1982 geboren. Mit fünf Jahren zog sie mit ihrer Familie nach Wien, wo sie bis heute lebt und auch in Berlin. Cotton arbeitet als Autorin aller vorstellbaren und unvorstellbaren Genres, seien es Gedichte, Essays, Erzählungen, Comics, theoretische Abhandlungen oder Übersetzungen oder in neueren Mischformen, im allereigensten Ton und Stil. In einem Interview sagte sie einmal, dass ihre Arbeit für manche so wirke, als wäre sie aus einem Kanalsystem der letzten Jahrhunderte gefischt worden. So sonderbar ist die Sprache. Und so, wie sie sagt, splatter chaotisch. Man weiß nie, ist es Bullshit, Zitat, oder wahrer als Boulevard. 2007 fiel sie mit ihrem Debüt der Fremdwörterbuchsonette erstmals und sehr erfolgreich auf. Es folgten unter anderem, also neben vielem anderen, die Erzählung Der schaudernde Fächer 2013, Fast dumm, Essays on the Road 2019, eine Mitwirkung bei der Reihe Das neue Alphabet 2021 und zuletzt das Buch Die Anleitung der Vorfahren 2023, in dem sie dem kolonialen Erbe Europas nachspürt. Ihre Bücher erscheinen bei Surkamp und auch bei anderen Verlagen, zum Beispiel bei den Schönen Spectre Books oder den Starfruit Publications. Sie ist neben dem Englischen und Deutschen auch mit dem Japanischen vertraut, was in den Figuren und Sprachen ihrer Protagonistinnen, wie sie sie nennt, stets präsent ist. Um vielleicht mit einer biografischen Beschreibung zu enden, die ihre polyglotte und kosmopolite Lebensform sehr gut beschreibt, zitiere ich hier eine Verschachtelung einer Biografie, wie man sie über Encotten im Internet findet. Ist auch Englisch jetzt. She's currently working on a PhD at the Peter Sondi Institute in Berlin and was awarded with a junior fellowship at the International Research Center for Cultural Studies in Vienna, thanks to which she is currently con conducting research at the University of Hawaii. Heute ist sie hier in Offenbach, wofür wir sehr dankbar sind. Herzlich willkommen. Danke, dass ich hier bin. Zu meiner weiteren Rechten, Ella Ponisowski bergelson Sie ist 1984 in Moskau geboren, 1991 nach Jerusalem eingewandert und lebt seit 2016 in Berlin. Oder wie sie selbst sagt, genau das bin ich, eine in Russland geborene Israelin, die in Deutschland lebt. Ponisowski Bergelson arbeitet als bildende Künstlerin mit besonderem Interesse. Vielleicht haben Sie es unten am Projektor gesehen, dort haben wir einige ihrer Arbeiten gezeigt, an Sprache, Schrift und Typografie. Ihre hybride Identität begreift sie als die Grundlage einer, wie sie selbst sagt, anarchistischen Ästhetik der Migration und hat daraus das Modell einer hybriden Kalligrafie entworfen. So, paralysieren sie, so paralysiert sie viele ihrer Installationen, ähm, Texte und Gedichte in jiddischer, arabischer und deutscher Sprache, so zum Beispiel in dem Projekt Kollektive Verinnerung aus dem Jahr 2019 und manchmal sind die Sprachen sogar in oder übereinander geschrieben, wie ein Palimpsest, so zum Beispiel die Arbeit Put Your Hand in Mine and Will Leave aus dem Jahr 2016, ausgestellt damals hier im Klingspurmuseum. Großer Bestandteil ihrer Arbeit sind großformatige Wandmalereien, so zum Beispiel bei ihrer Arbeit Among Refugees, Generation Y. Darin erzählt sie an verschiedenen Orten Berlins die gleichnamige Geschichte ihres Großvaters David Bergelson, ein berühmter jüdischer Schriftsteller, die dieser vor genau 100 Jahren geschrieben hat. Zuletzt stellte sie im Jahr 2020 bei der Art Biennale in Venedig eine interaktive Skulptur mit dem Titel Pseudo Territory vor, ein Begriff, der den Metaraum einer Nation bezeichnet, also nicht den topografischen, den geografischen Raum einer Nation oder eines Landes, sondern die durch Sprache und Kultur verbundene Nation. Wir lernen mit der Künstlerin und Textkünstlerin Ella Ponisowski Bergelson, Sprache ist ein striktes, ein rigides System von Zeichen das wir von Zeit zu Zeit aufbrechen müssen, aus dem wir von Zeit zu Zeit austreten müssen. Und so entstehen vielleicht neue Bilder, neue Formen und legen sich über die alten, die wir dann von der Unterseite 
anschauen können. Very welcome, Ella. We're very glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. So we spoke a lot about the title, the downside of language. <coughs> to both of you, is there a downside of language? I wanted to also add that down also has the meaning of the small feathers underneath the larger feathers in um, birds. And so if one thinks of also the, the underbelly mm -hmm. as another word that's also used for the downside, it's also a soft side and it's a vulnerable side. It could be dark. It could be the, the hen protecting her chicks or something. Mm. It certainly is the side I tend to feel comfortable in, I think. But at the same time, if you, especially if you think of the, the undercommons or things like that, of emphasizing the, the inofficial side of things or the denied side, it, it's important, I think, to keep Afro-pessimism as a position precisely as a white person who's not entitled to really talk about Afro-pessimism, but as a check against everything being discoursified and everything being objectified as something that we can use to produce more discourse. So I just wanted to somehow, mm -hmm. that, that those are the things that come to mind when I think of the downside. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking generally about downside. I think the term downside, there's no downside without an upside. So every disadvantage can be seen as an advantage. It depends from which direction you look at it. So every downside that I can mention is from another perspective is also a strength. But yeah, for me, the main downside of language is that uh, it's a bit, um, it creates an illusion of being precise. Uh, when in fact it's very, very subjective. Um, you can notice it when you switch in between different languages, how in one language, in direct translation to other, the whole meaning kind of twists and changes. And actually, yeah, I don't think we ever, we think we understand words in the same way, but actually each of us understand them anyway very, but I have to say, yeah. the difference is a tool for precision also. If you can flip the whole setup and see a kind of fuzziness as long as you see this as a kind of object, and if you observe exactly the movement that happens in a transition or a translation and see the difference and slight shift mm -hmm. between two meanings that are not one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. that creates a kind of precision that's, that seems to me much more precise than like the definition you would find in a, in a lexicon or something. But you probably need both kinds of precision because the, mm -hmm. the movement, it's like the wind, it only appears on some medium, mm -hmm. that kind of precision. Yeah. So somehow you I always see what have you a, like, yeah. a non-precise carrying the precise or something. I think it just said... The wind? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I raining. summoned it. Eh? Rain. Rain. I think you just said you feel more comfortable on the downside of language. How's that? Uh, I'm not sure if I can. <laughs> it's, it was maybe a bit coquette or something. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a quote by Arthur Ransom, who is a, he wrote a lot of children's books in English, and, one, and also some short stories. I think he was a big traveler. But one of the short stories is called The Inofficial Side, and it was I think a collection of short sort of anecdotes, strange happenings in the night. So you would sleep on a small sailboat and then suddenly someone comes in who's running away from something and I don't know, and, but he just sees, okay, the police are following this person. Don't know what this person's done, but of course I'm going to protect them in my sailboat or something. And mm -hmm. then he said the sentence, I always take the unofficial side. Mm. Which, but what does it mean? It's not, it's the kind of sort of adage or saying that you can't, you can't just import it into the kind of, into the official language and then have it there as a sentence, as a truth statement. Like in the analytic philosophy way of looking at things, it would be, become a kind of paradox, like the liar's paradox or something. I, mm -hmm. I always take the unofficial side. 
But then at some point, if I live long enough, then this side would necessarily become the official side if I do it assiduously enough. So mm -hmm. it can only be a kind of coquette thing to say that I, I, I walk on the wild side or something like that just until it gets gentrified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. If I say, if I declare it in a setting like this at least. Also, if you always choose the, the downside, it, it becomes official. Yeah, yeah, just because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like normalized. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. And then it becomes really radical to enter an institution or something. And mm. it, yeah, maybe it doesn't flip quite that way. But yeah. <laughs> but. So, I mean, you both speak in several languages and I don't know if you would say you're at home in English or in German uh, or in uh, Yiddish um, but how does that how is how is that for you with your work do you start always with a certain language and then translate and make the mistakes and create the friction that Anne just described while translating or is it changing from subject to subject it's uh, I mean I think I I've been bilingual since birth, so it's like um, something I grew up with and the um, two languages I grew up with, which is Hebrew and Russian, are very, very different origins, very, very different times of history. Hebrew is very ancient, it's very old, and different logic, different typography also. And I think I have a different personality in every language I speak. Mm -hmm. I think differently and I constantly I speak, I think every day I use at least four languages, depends who I'm speaking with or what I'm doing. And um, so it would be Hebrew, Russian, German, and English. And I feel like mostly I exist, me and my work and everything about us <laughs> is in the gaps in between those languages, is the tension in between what you can say in Hebrew and cannot say in Russian or can say or how. and. Me, I'm just in these gaps, and uh, also my work, I guess. Mm. And it's always trying to avoid being one and uh, comprehended by like one specific or defined by one specific mm. language or character. Yeah. So, so maybe just following on this, you don't really have uh, one language that you commonly go to and that's your main language or it depends when or where like mm -hmm. since I live in Berlin I have been uh, mostly talking English <laughs> um, yeah in Israel I'm talking mostly Hebrew it's I also change the places I live and yeah yeah hopefully in the future the German becomes more dominant than English let's see but it's constantly fluid and in every every language I would work in or use, I would always feel some kind of absence, like it's not enough because there are all these other things from the other languages, so yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. mm -hmm. one is not enough, two also not. <laughs> is it the same for so you? So eternally thirsty, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And somehow, I, at the moment at least, I think, I think of them as liquids with different qualities, mm -hmm. and also the, but the qualities are also dependent on the environment, so like molasses will be very slow, to start flowing, but then such viscoelastic ones. Once it starts flowing, it's hard to stop also. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the people. And amusingly, I have several friends where we do can do a lot of code switching between English, German, Japanese. Mm -hmm. And then for each of us, there's slightly slight differences in how fluent which one is. And mm -hmm. so by switching, we also are switching like, like bottoms and tops or something mm -hmm. or, or different different, um, because it always, if, if you stick in one constellation, and for example, one person is always speaking their second language and the other person is always speaking their first language, you create a, a very huge imbalance in the relationship. Yeah. And so it's, it's quite interesting to have like three or four different relationships with the same person mm. and very rapidly switch mm. them around. Yeah. So in a certain sense, it's quite literal if, if it's like multilinguality, sort of queering, like queering speaking or something, but it seems, but it's, yeah. it's con continuously evolving yeah. also with other influences and trends and, and what I happen to be reading or something. I feel like on top of what you said, like once you become the weak link, like when you speak the mm -hmm. language which you're not 
very um, trained in or like don't know it as well, then um, it also allows you all these other things. Like when you don't understand what people say, you understand much more because you're not only listening to words, you can see much beyond like because you just don't get the words. So it's not always that you're like, the weakest link in mm -hmm. one sense, yes, but sometimes actually the opposite, that's from my experience. Like sometimes you... And one, one thing I got really interested in is wordplay that has no etymological background. So that it's pure coincidence between languages that are completely unrelated. Mm -hmm. And then, especially with a friend of mine called um, Tada Kanako, who's a, a visual artist and who's learning German really fast, but in a very unique way. She writes, she paints pictures like trennbare verben, mm -hmm, yeah. divisible verbs, or <laughs> titles like that that come out of learning the language and, and feeling the sort of tension between different parts of the verb in German as, in, in a way that native speakers will never, or need a non-native speaker to really look at this picture and say, oh yeah, <laughs> maybe. But it's interesting talking to her also because, uh, because you can feel this sort of process of, or, or the, the chunkiness, like sort of a dough that's not yet mixed up when mm -hmm. you're learning a language and your statistics is not yet kneaded smooth. So mm -hmm. some word, maybe you are reading a lot of academic text and then you have some um, formula or like standard ways of saying things that are sort of chunkinesses. And it's somehow it's a beautiful process to get smoother and smoother and find what you need to say what you want to mm. say or to actually create you can somehow express yourself personalize it but then what you really want to do is you want to create a mood that you yeah. can share with other people and it sort of starts getting um, just getting an, an own dynamic mm. and often you know as a non-native speaker you feel like you're limiting the conversation or at least I feel that often with it's maybe because Japanese is much more um, sort of built in cooperation. Mm -hmm. Like there's this stick with pounding mochi that two people alternately hammer on the mochi, on the, on the glutinous rice ball. And if they get out of sync, then they actually seriously mutilate each other. So the art of conversation is just to keep this mm -hmm. flow going by always giving the, by being in timing, it's kind of a musical thing. And so mm -hmm. if you're a non-native speaker, and especially coming from languages that have this sort of um, Sosurian setup that mm -hmm. okay the sender sends and then and the listener listens and then we switch around and then the listener uh, okay. but it's in, in Japanese much more like one space that is played upon by a number of actors like playing cards on the table and I think in fact in like rural places are less less formalized discourse areas like if you watch a group of people who have been playing schnapps and for decades, then there's also this, basically it's the table that's speaking through the voices of the different members of the game or something. Mm. It's maybe a model that's not so exotic as it seems if I say this is specific to Japanese or something. Mm. Can you describe it a little bit more, how your interest grew in Japanese culture and language and how it influenced you? Maybe it was a coincidence because the father of my first boyfriend when I was in school happened to be working in Japan. Yeah. There was an Austrian writer, Martin Kubacek. And then, so listening to his stories was very interesting. And so at the same time I, I saw, oh, there's someone who's actually living, making a living as a writer that exists. And also someone who's living in Japan that exists, wow. And then, or Japan <laughs> exists, okay. and. And so many years later, I had the opportunity, also thanks to Martin Kubacek and his um, acquaintance, the German uh, professor Masahiko Tsuchiya, to teach in Japan. And then I kept on learning slowly, very sort of on the side, in, in various uh, biographical hiccups. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's remained really fascinating. And then the most recent, was so one of the most recent things was co collaborations with colleagues who are, who are also doing sort of translingual experiences in the other direction. So we, we would talk about or somehow incorporate these 
the things in the work. And I was, did one cooperation with Hibi Nosaki, who is a graphic designer and UX designer, so the uh, user experience, user interface designer. And she, she actually um, brought this theory of, or, or I wouldn't have think, I wouldn't have been be able to say this image with the room, contrasting it with the sender sender receiver model, so strongly if she hadn't presented with some literature and, and said from a Japanese perspective that that is a strong difference that she feels when she's talking with people uh, in a group of Japanese people versus a group of of um, Europeans or Germans, hmm. and maybe Germans and Austrians are also a little bit different in this respect because Austria is more provincial and so there's a little bit more of a card game dynamics in even big business affairs which is <laughs> one could also call corruption <laughs> anyway mm -hmm. it's something that feels very familiar but also well cozy mm -hmm. put it that way I mean, we spoke a lot about the difficulties of translating and that there's always a gap or like some friction and uh, you cannot really translate uh, perfectly in, in this sense uh, but also on the form level is there something that these different alphabets and these different letters and forms reveal something about uh, their culture they, they represent or they articulate they express in your experience everything they reveal everything the mm -hmm. forms the okay. forms I mean if you trace the origin of every letter in its form in every language you will reach you will go back to a painting and, or a drawing of something that will tell you a lot about the culture or how they used to live in the, way, in the time where this letter started developing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every letter mm -hmm. is a symbol of something that had to do with, the, was meaningful in the life once they started evolving from cave paintings to writing. So. Mm -hmm. But I also like the, the, the different layers of erosion in, and then if you have like artificial languages, like you know, the kind of languages like, or, or writing systems like, like Cherokee or, or Hangul that were basically invented or designed by one person mm -hmm. at a certain time. Mm -hmm. and, but then they also they carry some, some kind of subconscious or you know, design ha handwriting. Yeah. It's not like there's no meaning in them just because they don't have this sure. roots type of mm -hmm. meaning. Yeah. But it's a different kind. Or like the, the syllabary writings that are evolved from, from a, a kind of kurzhand, a kind of shorthand way of writing full characters mm -hmm. in, of, in the Chinese script system. That then the Japanese handwriting evolved these shortened forms or these um, simplified forms for denoting the sounds. And that I, I'm fascinated with the erosion process, also that also is echoed when you just try and read someone's handwriting. Mm -hmm. But then the difference between one collective idiosyncratic erosion that has something to do even with with the genetics of and the, the build of someone's hand maybe or, or or how people move their body, so that so you have a a sort of complexity of dynamics coming from one person's body versus a complexity of erosion dynamics coming from a huge body of users maybe somehow codified in a, in a process that goes through one person, possibly, if, if there's a one canonical book that was once um, decided upon in some cases, or, or a typeset or something. But it, somehow it excites me when the individual and the collective are like mirrors of each other or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I find it very interesting in your case what you just said about the forms of the, the signs and the letters. Uh, in your case, especially because you're a visual artist um, and you use several languages, different languages, and of course not everyone, especially when you do it in Berlin, uh, I mean, what does it mean? Like especially, not everyone understands the language. Maybe in Berlin they understand it more or less, it depends on where you do it. Uh, so if someone who reads or tries to read your morals, for example, and cannot decipher it because he or she cannot speak the language, uh, it's just a sign, it's a line. It's, 
maybe even decorated in a way, or it's a form. Um, how do you, do you think this is a very good way to approach your work? Do you try to convey this, or is it, is it rather a barrier sometimes? Um, for me, um, it's a good question. I, it will be an insult for me if someone instantly reads mm -hmm. what I write and understand this. This would be like bad, bad <laughs> art. Because <laughs> I try to buy time and also like to make people decipher and to see all these different meanings. And the way our brain are trained with writing is that we immediately interpret when something looks like text, we immediately start to see words, even if it's completely yeah. like n not real letters. Um, we can also do it with speaking, like imitate languages that don't exist, and people hear whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So it's my way to, to stretch the limits of m making things readable is my way to basically let the viewer put themselves in it and see where they don't understand something to find, to project on it whatever they want. So I kind of want to control and also let control and like let people put in it whatever they want. And it's very interesting to see what different languages, how they perceived in different places, like what happens in a, with a gigantic Arabic writing on the wall in uh, Reinickensdorf in Berlin, and what happens to it in Tel Aviv? Mm -hmm. How do people react to it? What does it, like the same writing, how it's being perceived depending on the wall you pair it with? And that's how much And what, what happens? Can you make a specific example or story? Uh, what happens? In Germany, I experienced not once that people sometimes are very intimidated by something, I think everywhere actually, but intimidated by something they cannot read mm -hmm. or something in a language they don't understand. If it would be just like an uh, abstract painting, it would probably um, would be much more likable than the stuff I do. <laughs> which are a lot of times like it's creating a lot of aggression, I have to say. But it depends also when, where, and yeah. But in ca and contrast to an abstract painting, the words mean something to someone, to a certain audience, they mean something. And those who just don't understand it, to them it's basically the line. Um, is that a, like, I'm, I'm curious about this, is, is that something that you yourself try to smooth or to radicalize? You mean the differences between languages mm -hmm. or, yeah, it depends. I mean, I go both ways and depends on the project, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are like some texts, I usually work with poetry a lot and sometimes I just take a poem and it's not mine, um, I borrow it <laughs> from someone and then I would write every word would be in a different language, so it will just mix into sentences that look um, coherent, but actually they completely mix all these different mentalities. Mm -hmm. Or um, a, And then, yeah, it's nice when it's like all adds up to this one texture. Or in other projects, they completely collide, like um, the Arabic verses, uh, the German, and uh, Hebrew. Sometimes I use languages which are dead, like not already not spoken since thousands of years, and it's fun because you can you can read it. You just need like to look it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, we had a reading yesterday in Vienna. It was organized to be in the Narrenturm, which is a building built by Josef der Zweite as a According to the phases of the moon, it was, it was sort of the, the overlap of, of very kind of mystic, esoteric ideas and Freemasons, I think. Mm. <laughs> and one of the first graffiti that was written on there was um, concerning Josef der Zweite Primus Exis, I think it was the first in here, first of the ones in here. But it was an asylum. It also didn't work very well. They, they forgot to add water or something. But anyway, they, they invited this, this event, invited 24 of the, in fact, most freaky authors in the area. Mm. 
because to, to read out of the windows without a microphone. Mm. And so the performances were very diverse. People who are actually living on the brink of being actually seen as, as crazy by a normal society, then somehow dealing with this framing. But uh, Brigitte Falkner, a writer who I admire very much also for her graphic work, she has this ability to speak in an invented language that sounds somehow like Danish, Swedish, Hungarian mm -hmm. mixture. Mm -hmm. And w watching the audience, there were several people who were entrusted, looking around at everyone else. Is everyone, does everyone else understand this? What is this? What's going on? Why is there no translation? There were, it was not a lot of people, but you could pick out the ones who were really cooking, mm -hmm. <laughs> realizing when, while mm -hmm. confronted with this tongue that couldn't be placed. I think it's not even so much not understanding, but not being able to put it in a category. You can't, yeah. you can't figure out. But if someone would from. just sing like some notes, it wouldn't bother them. But the moment it sounds like words or look like words, people want to understand. I think it just kind of sure. lights up. Yeah. Um, a different um, attention area in the brain where you're like, I need to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. There is communication. And it's really to strong, no? a, a, yeah. a block against sort of too facile, too quick um, picture looking, mm. picture consumption somehow also, no? that it keeps a, a space open for the, for the, for it, you don't have access to yeah. everything immediately. I think. Yeah, I mean poetry shares that, doesn't it? I mean, Some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think that Salam has a strong element of that. Of what is called hermetic is maybe has a, an element of fuck, but also an element. It's it's an open door, but it, going in involves various processes. Yeah. It's not like languages you don't understand are blocking you or anything. You just they just demand some engagement and maybe also going in some place it's impossible to go out of again. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's a one a way. Yeah. It's uh, life. Yeah. <laughs> life is a trap maybe, I guess. <laughs> maybe along those lines you said earlier to me that you are interested, and you said this to me, interested in language as a technology, as an instrument, as a system. Can you, can you describe that? Yeah. Oh, it's, like tools, you you have to learn how to use them, and they also connect you with all other users. And manipulating these tools, especially if there's, it's it's like a genre of tool or something, each letter or each word. So somehow, what I was trying, what I was saying earlier was that, as a, because I think you, you asked something like, why why did you why were you writing? Why did you start writing? Why did you choose writing as a as a medium or profession or something? And I think that even as a child, one has an instinct that this is a very powerful system. Code is, code is where to be, just like now. I mean, pro programming, unfortunately, I never got into programming, which is a powerful to squared thing, but in the digital realm. But mm -hmm. language outside of, the, out of programming in the strict sense is also, in a way, programming, but it's sort of soft programming, like working on organic material, working on sort of an an universichtliche mass of memories and experiences of other people. Like um, Azuma Hiroki and Yukui have a, a conversation that's actually in here. And the reason why we chose it, because it's a, a magazine I, I'm an editor of, and it's the first edition about thinking writing. And their interview, which is a couple years back, the thing that Azuma said, and he was just working on his book, The Philosophy of the Tourist, it was the point made is that he said, so I as a Hong Kong person speaking Chinese or reading Chinese and you as a Japanese, we can sort of understand each other's, or read each other's writing, but there's a, there's a fuzziness at the edges and this, that's quite different than the sort of clear cut Aristotelian habit of you know, either I understand it or I don't. Either, either the denotation is correct or it's wrong and trying to find these hard contours. But then it's easy to say, yeah, we deal with fuzzy edges and, and the edges, everything. But mm -hmm. just the practice that it leads to is, and, and then it's not like there's a disorganization, but there's an organization with soft edges that seems 
in some ways more human than than the models based on border tracing practices with like shibulet where you have to you're either in or out or you're with me or you're against me or you're you're the right race or the wrong race uh, we need the spaces between I think mm -hmm. But it's yeah. It's, I find it interesting that cold, which is often thought of as cold or or sort of hard or something, in contrast to warm physicality or something, that cold can also be very sort of organic or or very. It doesn't mean it's not a contrast between precision and softness necessarily. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also just wanted to ask you about what you feel with the gesture of writing. I mean, it would seem, to, at least to the outside, that you sometimes, you perform the gesture of writing in a space that's not, doesn't enter a one code or something, but so that the gesture at least just seems to become visible or, or, or pulled out. That was just from, from watching videos or things like that. But what, what are your thoughts about the, the gesture of writing. Also. You mean the action itself? So the yeah, the, sort of act. the act. Of course, uh, it's very varied, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's very much dancing. I think you know much more about Japan than I do, but like for them, it's a whole dance, the calligraphy, right? So, because I work in huge mm -hmm. formats, which are buildings mostly, um, I get to pay, to write not like this, but use also not this, but my entire arms sometimes, like to write in like huge dimensions. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's like a dance, it's like a registration of movement eventually the letter. The circle will be perfect if I just like move um, lightly. So it's a lot in the body, it's a lot have to be like very free also like not which stick. are true and also the the the, the strichfolge the, the, the stroke order which is stroke order is very important when writing kanji mm -hmm. because also if you write faster then if you do it in the wrong way then people can't read your handwriting mm. so just like we learn alphabet writing in school in a certain tradition that makes it mm. easier to write a slop read sloppy writing also um, but then you can also, at least if you're learning slowly like me, then you can tell if I wrote the, wrote the kanji wrong because something is wrong with the rhythm. And before I notice it visually, I, it's mm. the sort of micro ballet of the, of the hand that somehow yeah. feels wrong or something. Yeah, it's like dance. It's like you, I mean, when you dance with, without a mirror, how do you know you're symmetrical? How do you, like it's, You need yeah, a, a kind of protocol and yeah. an unlight or maybe. Step for step, a recipe, it's yeah. this sort of knowledge that unfolds. Because I, I do, admittedly, I often do it the wrong way. Like I, I copy visually from, from printed kanji mm. just for speed's sake or whatever. But actually, what you, what you really get is an is a unleitung. Do this line and then this yeah. line and then this line. So they explain like from which direction to Well, there's certain yeah. basic rules that, that almost always hold true and then there's some weird situations that you're not sure which would go first and then you check mm -hmm. you look it up and in the end it's sort of several different systems that seem to support each other to result in a correct kanji. And also I mean it's a very meditative state right like to um, for me like writing. For me it's technical, like <laughs> technical but I think it should, could be meditative. When I, was I mean, if you have to really go into it, it has to, I have to kind of disconnect from everything else and just like feel it's like very bodily. It's, I would probably do more or less the same if I close my eyes, because it's mm -hmm. really in the body in a way. And uh, yeah. I would be interested in the process of painting a moral that is by, default a life process and how that informs uh, your work, how, that, how, how, you, how do you perceive that? Because it's the opposite end of a writer, for example, who always uh, like isolates, mm -hmm. at least while writing. Maybe you disagree because your case <laughs> says that end, but uh, you can maybe. I mean, yeah, it's uh, probably the cliche writer isolates, but maybe not uh, 
I mean, yeah, probably you need your concentration if you're going to write. Well, I feel like like language like a network and also the also writing kanji and all these differentiating from variants possible. It's it's like like a crowd is is the kind of visual image, mm. and then making choices and also positioning or like walking through a busy street or something. There's also from any point on the paper, there's so many ways you could go and choosing the right word is is kind of a it's a stressful process but it's also like walking along a path like the kind of path that is a little bit entertaining for your feet when you have some rocks and some you don't want to sprain your ankle and you're trying to go fast and maybe there's some shadow and light play so that gives your brain and foot massage sort of so because you're trying to go as fast as possible but not make any mistakes and sort of invent the sentence as you go. And that's, that's what writing feels like mm. for me, kind of. But of course, if in addition to all that, all this crowdedness, then people start bothering me that are really in the room, that's of course hell. That's, that's yeah. so, so, so it's true, I, one needs a quiet space. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the murals, yeah, it's a public thing, mm -hmm. it's outside. And it's part of it, you have to deal with everyone, with the neighbors, with the police, with everything. Have you worked <laughs> illegally and legally both? Uh, it's been a while since I went illegally just because I'm lazy and want to sleep at night. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But uh, yeah, even when I do things completely legally and everything, street is blocked, uh, with all exams, with the Gnemengung, everything is fine. I still get the police five <laughs> times a oh. day. Oh. But uh, yeah, that's life in art. But yeah, I think it's part of it that I, it's also when you do things in a public space, it's, it's, it stops being your own business. It starts being everyone's business and it's your own choice to do it there. You cannot, I mean, it's very different than creating in the context of a museum or a gallery where people choose to come in and w look at your art. And when you work in the street, they don't choose it. There's something Uh, aggressive in it, I would say. I'm not proud of it, but like you kind of impose what you do in the public space, and not necessarily the person who lives um, directly in front of it loves it, you know. So there is always this conversation with the environment. Some people love it, and some hate it, and all this in between, and how children feel about like there is you. You have to address that. You cannot just come and paint and go. So this is, and I had, I always learn, you know, I have experience when I say to myself, okay, like maybe this, now I can, for example, I think I will never paint again on like a residential building. Like I, I that was very hard experience. Why I, was that? Did people start quarreling or something? No, it's just that I feel, I mostly painted on public spaces, public mm -hmm. buildings, so like buildings which are either belong to the government or used publicly as a public space or studios or clubs. But um, apartments is different. People live there and I, I feel, yeah, it's difficult to impose. No one asks them, you know? You and I think I'm imposing, like, the, fi the time I did it, like, I made three murals on residential buildings in Berlin, and I decided that I will not do it anymore, at least for the time being. Because, <laughs> yeah, it has an aggressive aspect to it. Well, in Berlin especially, right, you have the amazing, funny interventions of people with, with paint rollers from the mm. roofs illegally yeah. writing great comments on society. Yeah. And then you have the house owners, the new people from Bayern or West Germany or something, that have, if the pension is to invest their money in a house in Berlin and then they engage some legal sprayers to make a beautiful mur mural yeah. to protect the house from this anarchy. Yeah. And then, so it's sinister in, in, the <laughs> in quite a different way somehow. Yeah. But the, then people look at, looking at the mural won't know the background, so they could be confused, even if it's a good kind of mural. Mm -hmm. Like, I think another colleague in Austria, El Avadala, she won in the lottery, 
Uh, sorry, no, no. She won in a game show, in like a uh, quiz game show, a lot of money. And then she bought the house she lived in, and it needed retiling the roof. And that was just before. I think the American president was coming. The new one. By now. Um, no, it was, uh, it was a longer. I okay. think it was Trump go home, or maybe it was even further back, and it was Obama go home, which is. A pity in hindsight, <laughs> like Obama come <laughs> in, in comparison. Yeah. But some, some kind of message in pink that, uh, that, that's mm. come back from the Immobilien anecdotes. <laughs> but writing that stays also is funny because it has, it's, has such a trägheit, such an inertia as a medium, mm. especially in cityscapes. Mm. Yeah, in Berlin it's all mixing, that's what I love, like all these different ways of painting in the public space are mixed and like all the ways you mentioned. And this creates a really a masterpiece of its own, all together, like everything separately is not much, but then all together the texture is just... Yeah, someone, there was a, a very beautiful mural of a, a beautiful, sort of dark flower, Blumenstrauss. And then some, somebody <coughs> did a sort of Russische Rakete in pink, <laughs> and now it's <laughs> even more beautiful. Yeah. But unfortunately, they overpainted it because it was probably not so good for children as an influence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was nice, nice palimpsest. Ich würde gerne langsam die Fragen auch von Ihnen zulassen, wenn Sie wollen. Aber eine Frage noch an dich, Anne, vielleicht auch auf Deutsch, weil du es auch auf Deutsch gesagt hast. Mhm. Das fand ich sehr schön. Du hast gesagt, du schreibst mit großer Ungeduld und zimmerst deine Texte immer so zusammen, weil sonst die Gefahr besteht, dass du etwas nachplapperst und du würdest sehr gerne deine eigenen Ideen, die eigenen Sachen, die du denkst, hervorbringen und nicht etwas nachplappern. Deswegen machst du das alles sehr schnell und rasch. Und ich habe mich gefragt, ist, diese, ist, ist, das eine, ist das eine Sicherheitsmaßnahme, dass wir wirklich deine Texte lesen und nicht so stark ähm, die, die Einflüsse herauslesen? Also ich glaube gar nicht an selbst, das ist ein Konglomerat aus Einflüssen. Aber natürlich gibt es halt verschiedene Schichtungen und ich will, in, als, als dass ich der Gegenwart natürlich Kontrolle haben einigermaßen, das heißt überhaupt Bewusstsein haben über das, was ich jetzt präsentiere als Text. Und in, in der Muttersprache, oder nicht in der Muttersprache, sondern in meinem Fall in der Kurrentsprache oder so, in der äh, Laufumgebungssprache, für die, die Deutsch ist bei mir, also das ist die, die Sprache, die am meisten fließt, weil ich da in die Schule gegangen bin, mit der Gesellschaft in Kontakt bin. Mhm. Da passiert dieses Plappern manchmal, also dass, dass das so intuitiv, flowig funktioniert, dass man dann quack, 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 also einfach wie ein Wasserfall Sachen sagt, die man vielleicht gar nicht sagen wollte. Und um diesen Flow zu stoppen. Aber irgendwas verwirrt mich gerade, weil ich kann mir nicht vorstellen, dass ich genau das gesagt habe. Oder wenn ich das gesagt habe, dann war das genauso ein Fehler, den ich hätte vermeiden müssen. <lacht> weil eigentlich, also das Schnellschreiben ist, da passiert ja eher dieses Plappern. Mhm. Aber es kann auch sein, dass dass wenn man zu lange wartet, also dass, man, dass es nicht aus einem Guss ist, da an so einem Gespräch kann ich mich ein bisschen erinnern, das geht aber so ein bisschen um Tage, also wenn ich jetzt an, wenn ich an einem Aufsatz schreibe oder so, und das, das liegt zu lange, bevor es endet, dann ist diese, also es gibt so einen schönen Parallelismus zwischen dem Schreibfluss und dem Lesefluss, der wahrscheinlich so etwas wie ein Gedankenfluss ist, also dass es, ohne viel darüber nachzudenken oder viel bewusst zu konstruieren, sich die Sachen von selbst sozusagen auf eine plausible Art aufbauen und wieder abbauen oder, oder dass die Wege nachvollziehbar sind. Und wenn man da anfängt, so rumzuhäckseln und umzustellen und, oder, oder irgendwie stecken bleibt und dann nach Offenbach fahren muss und wieder zurückkehrt oder sowas und dann hat man ein völlig anderes, andere Wege im Kopf, andere Gespräche, dann kann es sein, dass da irgendwas total durcheinander gerät. Insofern vielleicht das Schnellschreiben in Terms of Days oder Weeks in einem Guss quasi und dann liegen lassen und dann noch einmal prüfend drüber gehen oder sowas. Mhm. Aber 
Mhm. Ja, so hatte ich es verstanden, mhm. dass du gesagt hast, es gibt bestimmte Referenzen, die dann einfach sehr stark sind. So habe ich mir das zusammengereimt, dass, wenn du sie, dass du sie nachplapperst. Also dass mhm. das, nicht das Plappern selbst, sondern das Nachplappern vielleicht bestimmter Eindrücke oder so, die du noch nicht, die noch nicht durch deine Stimme und durch dein, äh, vielleicht deine Autoschaft hindurchgegangen sind, obwohl du das ja auch nicht so sagen würdest. Nee, würde ich nicht. Also ich, es geht mir nicht darum, jetzt unique zu sein oder meine, meine Hand, meine, meine Markenzeichen da immer zu pflegen oder sowas. Das ist ein Instagram-Filter. Aber es gibt natürlich Sachen, die ich nicht sagen will. Und vor allem, weil ich in vielen Hinsichten, aber auch so auf so einer Mikroebene gegen die Gesellschaft von Europa oder auch von globalen Norden oder wie man sagt, als jemand dir genau daherkommt und aus einem kolonialen Hintergrund kommt, habe ich als, also da nehme ich mir sozusagen heraus, einerseits bestehe ich aus dieser Substanz eines kolonialen Massivverbrechens der letzten Jahrhunderte, also körperlich auch, das ist das, was ich esse, das ist das, was mich vor, vor Sachen beschützt und so weiter, diese Infrastruktur. Und andererseits nehme ich mir eben heraus, der Mensch in diesem Augenblick zu sein, die das nicht in Ordnung findet und die das auch auf einer auch physischen Ebene extrem ekelhaft findet und das in der Mikrostruktur der Sprache auch wiederfindet. Mhm. Und das ist wahrscheinlich das Nachplappern, das ich vermeiden will oder das ich, das ich ertappen will. Und dieses Ertappen ist das eine, aber das kann ausufern in einen komplett lähmenden Horror. Also, dass man sich selbst sieht als irgendeine so weiße Göre, die dann so einen Scheiß schreibt. Und das klingt genauso und schaut auch genauso aus. Und das sind genau die Ideen, auf die so eine Person kommen würde. Und das, da kann man dann richtig depressiv werden und nicht mehr leben wollen, wenn man das so wahrnimmt. Das heißt, da braucht man wiederum Zeit, glaube ich, und Technik. Und also man muss sich ablenken, andere Sachen lesen, Musik hören, also so sich diese Dankbarkeit reinziehen, dass es andere Leute gibt, die geile Sachen machen und dass man nicht alles selber machen muss. Und sich Zeit geben und auch diese Technizität hier ist, finde ich, hilfreich. Das ist, das ist nicht alles meine Schuld, wenn das alles Kacke ist. Ich kann es wahrnehmen und bin beteiligt. Und die Arbeit, die Sachen zu verändern, ist halt eine langwierige Arbeit, die gleichzeitig auf, groß, auf großer und kleiner Ebene stattfinden muss. Und das braucht Zeit hm. irgendwie. Also, ich weiß nicht, irgendwie gleichzeitig hart zu sich selber und nicht zu hart zu sich selber zu sein, wahrscheinlich in dem Maß, wie man, wie man dann selber merkt, man kann sich sehr einfach machen oder man kann sich halt super schwer machen und beides ist also irgendwie so ein griffiger Mittelweg ist wahrscheinlich das, was wirklich ermöglicht, etwas zu ändern. Also was, 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 was kalligrafisch sozusagen dann sich in der Gesellschaft auswirkt. Aber also die Idee, das ist ja nur so ein manisches Phantasma, oder so, das, das die Art, wie Leute die Straße entlang gehen, ändert sich von Generation zu Generation und die Geschlechter erodieren und die, die Diskriminierung von, also von Einheimischen und Nicht-Einheimischen und so weiter erodiert, weil Leute einfach ähm, gemischte Hintergründe haben und sich auch die Arten, sich im öffentlichen Raum zu bewegen, irgendwie morphen. Und der Prozess, der, das ist, der passiert eigentlich von selbst, aber man kann ihn natürlich man kann dagegen arbeiten oder man kann so mit dem mitgehen oder das erkennen oder verstärken, wie eben Kalligrafie so ist. Das ist nicht Autorschaft in dem Sinn. Also das ist eine Interaktion oder mit einem System und mit einem Moment und mit einem Skill, der embodied ist mhm. und mit so einer, ja, mit Glück vielleicht, mhm. weiß nicht. The weather. The weather, <lacht> weather is weather. the most important. <lacht> Okay, ähm, gibt es denn ein paar? Ja. Ähm, ich war vor ein paar Tagen, ich habe ein paar Tage gesehen, mhm. Das sind vielleicht noch sehr komisch klingende Dinge, aber ich mag die, 
die Lage, also es auf, der, auf der westlichen Seite sind so sanfte Hügel, vor Alp, die in die Voralpen übergehen, dann gibt es die Donau und dann geht es in die ungarische Tiefebene hinein. Also es hat so eine Schwellensituation. Und dann innerhalb von Wien ist auch die, die, die Winkel des Bodens sozusagen sehr vielfältig. Also man hat das Gefühl, man kann sich mit den Füßen orientieren. Das ist dann radikal anders in einer flachen Gegend. Und ich habe das Gefühl, dass sich das auf den Satzbau, auf den regional geprägten Satzbau auswirkt. Und so Autoren, die ich sehr mag, also aus der Teenagerzeit noch her, so wie Robert Musil oder Hermita von Doderer, die haben einen sehr ähm, dreidimensionalen Satzbau, würde ich mal sagen. Und das finde ich immer noch eigentlich aufregend. Also Doderer ist zum Beispiel der Sohn von einem Ingenieur, der beteiligt war an der Wienflussregulierung. Also das ist ein, der, die Wien, also danach ist quasi die Stadt benannt oder umgekehrt und sie fließt in die Donau und ist ein sehr stark reguliert, also es schaut, da ist der U-Bahn-Schacht und ein total ähm, leer betonierter Schacht für den Fluss, der normalerweise nur ein kleines Rinnsaal ist, aber, aber saisonal flutet. Äh, ein bisschen ähnlich wie in Sarajevo, das auch in derselben Zeit gebaut wurde, also überdimensional, aber hin und wieder zahlt sich das aus. Und, diese, und dann gibt es so also Wehren und dann ein Rückhaltebecken, für Fluten und das, das Design von diesen Sachen hat etwas sehr leicht also bizarr, pervers, quirliges. Das, das ist sicher nur meine Fantasie, aber mir gefällt der Gedanke, dass irgendwie übergenerational das Kind, das beim Designprozess von dieser Wienflussregulierungsarchitektur und dort gelebt hat, die hatten da so ein Haus daneben, dass, die, dass der dann diesen merkwürdigen Satzbau Pflegt. Und Doderer ist jetzt keine, keine absolute Lichtfigur, der hatte ein, man muss sagen, ein perverses Verhältnis zum Nationalsozialismus und auch also so eine Art Fetisch für dicke jüdische Damen, was extrem bedenklich ist <lacht> als, als Ding, aber auch einfach nur weird und so eine unpolitische Art, ein Nazi zu sein, aber es ist auf jeden Fall auch ein bisschen ekelhaft, aber man kann ihn auch einfach also ich so ein grauslicher alter Kobold irgendwie, aber trotzdem habe ich seinen Satzbau halt immer sehr ähm, faszinierend gefunden und, und so Erzählungen, wie das er schreibt, wie er einen Besucher empfängt und möchte den aber doch nicht treffen und versteckt sich in seiner eigenen Wohnung im Bad und wirft dann mit der Seife nach seinem Freund, der dann, es ist so, ich, kann, ich weiß ganz genau, das stimmt. <lacht> das hat er wirklich gemacht. Also. Aber andererseits ist er auch so ein Hitzinger, also Hitzinger ist ein Nobelviertel in, in Wien. Das also merkt man auch, der ist mit irgendwie so gestopften Kindern auf so Partys oder so Homepartys gemacht. Und irgendwie ist diese Atmosphäre auch, der kommt ins Plappern total bei seinen, das sind riesige Bücher, die Dämonen oder Wahrscheinlich versuchte er den Dostoevsky zu machen, aber halt auf eine provinzielle österreichische Variante davon. Und hat dann, also das ist einfach nur so eine Art, wie, wie so, eine, so eine Hitzinger Oma, die in ihrer, in ihrer viel zu großen, betulichen Wohnung rumdüdelt und an den Namen von diesen verschiedenen Leuten mit ihren ganzen Nicknames im Militär und so weiter dann sagt. Das Beste war, als ich das als Hörbuch hatte und dann irgendwie die MP3s die Reihenfolge vertauscht wurden und das war völlig egal. <lacht> also, weiß nicht, vielleicht so diese Mischung aus Wurstigkeit und Hochpräzision ist dann auch typisch für Wien oder so. Wir renovieren ja auch nicht die Cafés. Das, ist, das muss extrem dreckig sein, also dass der Dreck so eine, wie man von Klee, von Klee wurde komplementiert, dass die Bilder ausschauen als wie, wie Schimmel, der dort gewachsen ist, so so, so wie, von, wie natürlich wie von der Hand der Natur entstanden. Und das ist, diese Patina wird geschätzt so als, als Zeichen der Wurstigkeit. Also, ne? Yes, we drifted. <lacht> Doing that on a more, um, yeah, 
what kind of difference do you see in between the two? Why would you bring up that you have less authority to speak about African imperialism while you do own the authority to talk about learning Japanese in school in that sense, in dancing in school you are? Well, I think with the, in the case of the kanji, I'm just in that process. I've been, I mean, I, I try not to talk as an expert, but as someone who's learning and talking about the learning experience. But also, exotism is seriously a thing that I, th I think a lot about because I know I am exotistic. I like, like my, my parents are from Kansas and Iowa. They already left the U US, which is a place that they're not, it's not where their heritage is. It's uh, several generations of cut off roots, consciously cut off, as a foolish decision, maybe as a as a how do you say an arrogant decision, whatever. Or the, I don't even know the immigration history behind that. So I can't even say there's any place in the world that I actually have any legitimacy to talk about. But if I've spent um, ten or fifteen years um, working, acquiring a system of writing, then I don't feel as uncomfortable. And also, as you say, there's between Japan and Europe. I don't feel. Uh, uh, like a, a status gap that needs to be corrected so strongly. There's more, there's, there's a huge amount of Japanism in the background, and I try and avoid that, but it's, it's, it's hard to navigate, of course. In the case of Afro-futurism or Afro-pessimism, I feel it's a quite a different case because it's about skin color, and it's, skin color cannot be subtracted out of this discourse. And it's a skin color that I never will possess. And at the same time, I feel it's important as a white person to be reading this. And then it's a fine line between feeling that at the same time, I feel it's important to also, and it's just an important position that exists in the world and that I am very interested in and respect. And at the same time, as soon as I'm sitting on a stage in the spotlight with a microphone and I mention the word, then it looks again like I'm using this to promote my own status as a cool person who's aware of all these important things. So it's very difficult because I'm trying to, on the one hand to do good work and to talk about things I think are interesting and helpful to know about and fascinating to think about and important to also use as a corrective against some false cliches and false like just small worlds that we, we grow up in and, and it's such a process to get out of and at the same time so that's why I, I did do exactly the move that by saying that I, by mentioning that I shouldn't mention it, then trying to get out of the, the thing, it's, it's indeed, it's, it's very difficult. And I don't think I can do everything right at the end of the day. Yes? Ich habe das Gefühl, dass ich immer daran arbeiten muss, überhaupt an ich oder an selbst. Also für mich sind diese Wörter jetzt keine Kontraste, aber natürlich, ich brauche das Ich, um gegen die Gesellschaft etwas, einen Schwung zu bekommen oder so etwas. Aber es ist gleichzeitig eigentlich irgendwie eine leere Schale, in die alles reinkommt, was ich erlebe. Insofern glaube ich nicht daran, aber ich benutze es würde ich so sagen, als, als Gefäß, das aber ständig ein falsches Gefäß ist oder ein momentanes oder sowas. Wenn ich das, ich weiß nicht, also sicher wie, sagt man nur, ich glaube nicht an das Selbst und da ist schon wieder ich im Satz drin. Also, wer sagt diesen Satz? Da braucht man ein gewisses Selbstbewusstsein auch dazu. Ja, ist, ähm, ja gute Frage. Ich denke noch ein bisschen drüber nach, Ja, es stimmt auch, dass man ja so eine, so eine praktische Naivität braucht, zumindest in dem Moment, wo man schreibt, oder? Es ist nicht so leicht, gleichzeitig zu reflektieren und zu, in den Flow zu kommen oder so. Aber
Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, work with you as material as, as uh, opposed to against you. So do you mean um, the the material, the surface itself, the texture and the material, or? Yeah, because, because there's kind of like this negative connotation to surface, right? Like superficiality or like surface, surface mm. level knowledge, maybe. Um, and so if, if we think of language as something that does not penetrate, but like hover on the surface, like how can we figure? All right. Uh, uh, interesting. So yeah, first of all, site specific. I mean, uh, I can't see you, <laughs> but yeah. Um, when I talk about site specific, I mean that I believe that a connection of a specific text with a specific wall is already carries a statement or a message or some depth. Like, what? If you choose to put the same text on a different wall in a different place, it will carry a different message. And uh, so that's a site specific aspect. And as for the surface, yeah, um, surface is uh, interesting, like as a metaphor, but me, like so many of my murals, I treat the surface like I try to create something that will blend in and eventually also like kind of fade like it's determined with the materials I use sometimes like for example if you paint with I don't know oil paint on ceramics it will eventually like crumble and fall it will take years but it will uh, happen eventually so yeah the surface would influence a lot the material I don't know if it answers your question yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and like to, about the superficial or depth, I don't know, it's too far for me to think about this way. Like it's, uh, yeah. it's always superficial, like the painting is always a painting. It doesn't go, um, there are layers to it, but it's always on the surface. I'm actually interested in the, exactly that metaphor because they also you, you also speak of deep learning and like deep um, structures, which are like more stable than superficial changes. Or there's many meanings, but in a, a certain mathematical sense, there's a meaning of this depth that um, that gives the whole dynamics a different dynamics than if it were uh, in the same metaphor, superficial. Mm -hmm or a, a linear, um, one or two layered dynamics, mm. or shallow dynamics. Mm. So then shallow and deep get this sort of flow math kind of meaning, which makes a lot of sense to me because language is a kind of statistical building. And the, when you look at language change, what's changing is frequencies of, of word use, but all, all phrases and maybe the melodies, which are harder to track or has been until now there's recordings. I think probably it's easier to track speech melodies than it used to be. Mm -hmm. But then to analyze that data, you would be able to model it and find something like a, a deep structure that keeps things readable, that you know, we can read text from the Middle Ages because of something like a deep structure that stays the same despite superficial mm -hmm. changes. Yeah. It's the core. Yeah. It's the dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, vielleicht noch eine Frage, wenn noch Bedarf ist. Ansonsten muss auch nicht. 
Okay, dann Ella, Anne, vielen Dank. Das war Thank sehr schön. You. Danke.